Good morning and welcome to the second secondary parent workshop, this time on assessment for all, supporting our students in school and at home with assessment preparation. Joining me today, we have our diploma coordinator, Ms. Gitter, our grade eight to 10 pastoral lead, Ms. Tammy, and our examinations officer, Ms. Anita. Today, I briefly want to highlight the uh, assessment, how we do assessment here at ISV. Also, how the school supports students regarding assessment. And most importantly, how parents can support their child with assessment. Here we have a reminder of what an ISV student will achieve during their time here. An assessment is part of that. At ISV, we see skills development as fundamental and going hand in hand with student assessment. Do note, we do not explicitly assess such skills. So when we think of assessment, what do we think about? You can see here some words that are jumping out. It's about students. It's about learning. It's formative, it's informing, it's providing information. It's looking at strategies and suggestions and challenge and how we use and the need for assessment. So assessment is important. And for us, assessment is about empowering a student to check on their understanding and their progress along their learning journal. The IB wants students as part of the learner profile to become more knowledgeable, more thinkers in this learning journey. Here is a quote from ISV's assessment policy which shows our vision of assessment in the secondary school. We'd now like to explain a bit about what we do in ISV to do with assessment, supporting students to empower them in their own learning. Subject teachers in secondary school develop a programme of instruction designed to promote that previous quote. During secondary school, students have regular opportunity to demonstrate not only what they know, but also what they're learning. The forms of assessment may include quizzes, projects, end of unit activities and tests, essays, oral presentations, and written examinations. Formal assessment tools provide the main method by which students, as well as teachers, gauge progress and set goals for the next stage of learning. Through formative assessment, students are encouraged to take ownership of that learning. Beyond the use of assessment for learning strategies, all students in secondary school undertake scheduled summative assessment tasks throughout the course. These assessments include 
end of unit tests, specific homework assessments, and in-class assessments of various kinds. Class set assessments are undertaken with specific guidance from the class teacher, which may vary from class to class. These, together with the school-based examinations at the end of each semester, provide marks with which we use our reporting grades. At ISV, we think about the purpose of assessment and the reason for the assessment. Our focus is on the reason for assessing. It is important always that students reflect on the assessments and identify what were their successes and their areas for development. Assessment, which feeds into the teaching learning process is fundamental. Success for the students comes from them owning their understanding in preparation to support their learning journey. Here we can see how we assess using success criteria, rubrics from published examination board specifications. We ensure that we standardize and moderate student work so that we have reliability and validity in each one of those assessments, that those grades are fair and just. We want to ensure that students are empowered and understand their successes and those areas to develop. When a grade is awarded to an assessed piece of work in the secondary school, it is calculated from grade boundaries developed from the published boundaries for that subject. These can be found in the task categories in manage back classes. They're also reshared when semester reports are released. Each teacher records all summative grades in line with the expectations for the program. Semesters and end of year cumulative grades are calculated from agreed grade weightings, which include all summative assessments, as well as the end of semester and end of year examinations. We can see here an example of the grade boundaries and task categories and weightings from the IGCSE French course in grades nine and 10. At each semester reporting cycle, reports record summative achievement levels from weight, weighted summative tasks, including end of semester and end of year examinations, as well as an overall grade and individual grades for an examination session. All reports include a written commentary on students' performance, as well as targets towards future progression. School reports are shared with students and parents at the end of each semester. The first report is a semester one review, while the end of year report is a combination of the second semester and the overall year progress. Parent teacher conferences form part of the wider reporting with an ISV. Secondary school parent teacher conferences take place in the autumn and spring term and draw on both summative as well as formative tasks and the professional observations of the teacher on the student's progress and to help set specific targets for each student within that reporting cycle. At ISV, we encourage students to attend the PTC conference so they are part of those discussions.
So let's have a look at each area of the secondary school. Here we start with the structure of the secondary school. This encompasses grades six through to eight with the subjects that the students take. Currently, all in lower secondary is assessed internally. Currently, we use a letter system where A is the top grade and U is the bottom grade. Here is the structure for grades 9 and 10, where students will take the external Cambridge IGCSEs. It is required that students take GCSE examinations in the subjects studied. All students must take English language and mathematics and science. The grade nine starters will take coordinated science worth two GCSEs. And the grade 10 starters will take combined science. All students must take a language and physical and health education. Grade nine starters will take three other IGCSEs and grade 10 starters will complete two internal pre-DP courses one based on the humanities and one either computing, music or visual arts. For IGCSE, yeah, they are formal external assessments. Normally 100%, however, there are some in-school assessments, the practical elements of music and art and design, for example. IGCSE externally written and externally assessed examinations take place in the May and June of grade 10. Some students will take some papers in May and June of grade nine. This is usually mathematics. The official timetable is released in the early spring and shared by our examinations officer with students and parents. These examinations take place on campus. The oral examinations for foreign languages normally take place in the spring term of grade 10. And finally, all practical elements must be completed by April of grade 10. Following the Cambridge IGCSE graded system, we use this for all classes in grades nine and 10. Again, we use a letter system where A star is the top grade and U is the bottom grade. Finally, we move on to the grade 11 and 12 programme, the IB diploma. Most students will take the full diploma some students may be required to take IB courses in specific subjects only. It is required that students take IB examinations in the subjects studied. Here we can see the IB diploma programme for the current grade 11 students taking their final exams in May 2023. We know the IB is an internationally recognised programme, including here in Vietnam. And you can see with the combinations, students continue to have choice. For us, what is fundamental is the core, which develops the skills and educates the whole person. For DP, it's formal external assessment. Normally, it's around 70% for final written examinations and around 30% for the in-school internal assessment. IBDP internally written and externally assessed examinations take place in the May of grade 12. The official timetable is released in late winter 
and shared by our diploma coordinator with students and parents. These examinations take place on campus. Oral examinations for Group 1 and Group 2 languages normally take place in the spring term of Grade 12. All internal assessment must be completed by March of Grade 12. We follow the IB grading system for groups one to six subjects. Seven is the top grade and one is the bottom grade. For deeply core subjects, such as TOK and the extended essay, A is the top grade and E is the bottom grade. To successfully be awarded the full diploma, students must meet all the requirements of the awarding of the diploma. These can be found on the IB website. So how does the school help? Well, we look at it from two areas, the subject lessons, as well as the homeroom lessons. Subject teachers plan with the assessments in mind and share with students clear guidance so that each student can see their success in learning. And here we have some examples how that happens. Homeroom teachers, both in morning registration, our preparation for learning time, as well as the Friday period five lesson, discuss areas of assessment with students. We look at study skills in general and time management. When it comes to nearer exams, we're looking at revision and revision lists and study timetables. We talk to them about their well-being during the examination time about having time to study, but time to rest, eating well, exercising, and controlling that stress management. And finally, assessment is about empowering students. It really is the key to them owning their learning. However, as you can see here, we as parents and teachers must ensure that students don't see assessments as a way of labeling themselves, that they don't become obsessed with grades and that they are not trying to do better than others, but always looking to work for themselves. And when you're ready, Ms. Gitta, I will turn the slide to the next one, okay. whenever you're ready. I could already turn the slide and then people could start logging in. Um, what we're going to ask you to do is there should be a lot. If you look at the top of the slide, there's a login link. It's called polleb.com backslash Gitta Gamota 879. If you log into that, you will be able to begin to answer the question that you see in front of you. What concerns do you have for your son daughter in preparing for upcoming examinations? And if you could enter your concerns and we'll start to see those concerns come up in responses on the slide here. At least we hope we will, <laughs> if everything's working. And Mr. Colin, I think I'm going to hand over hosting back to you.
Okay, um, is anybody finding it difficult to get in? Is there, I'm just wondering, we don't have responses showing up yet or is it taking time just to log in for you? Ah, there we go. Okay, stress. Uh, being overly concerned on grades, yes. Okay, stress again. Ms. Gitta, in the chat, someone also wrote time management. Okay, time management as well. Okay. Yes, yeah, so if you're not able to get into the site, please feel free to write in the chat as well. Studying online is making it much more difficult, yes, to focus and perhaps not really be aware of the examinations coming up as well in some ways. Stress and time management. Mm -hmm. Okay, please do feel free to keep adding things here. I think we're seeing a lot of the same things in terms of stress and time management right now. But one of the purposes of this um, poll was to kind of give you a sense that it's not just you who's worried about it. It's that we have all of our families that have this as a concern right now. And that as a result of this, we probably need to talk about how we can support our students overall in our own homes to ensure that um, we're making those connections that they need to be successful in their exams while also managing to balance their life. So one of the things I just see showed up on the screen is lack of social contact and physical exercise, which is a key component to being a balanced person. And we as adults know that um, personally how important that is, but it takes a while for our children to understand that balance themselves because they haven't had to make that step away from understanding how to find it. And when they start that examination process, it's really something new to them and very different. And they have to start looking at how to not only organize their learning time, but also organize their revision time and be ready for those examinations. Um, Okay, and I, I think this is an interesting one with the social distancing. We, we have some problems with communication every so often. And I have a, a Vietnamese one. If could, could someone translate that for me, perhaps, just so? Ms. Van, are you? Yeah, Ms. Gita, um, the translation for this uh, idea is here that my, my daughter or my son is studying the IB program and he or she wants to get the seventh grade for history, biology, mathematics, but she or he feels that the teachers do not help uh, her understand all the requests of the assessment or the exam, um, or uh, he could not understand all the method to uh, complete the assessment or exam. Okay, and so, so that's a very good point in terms of students understanding the rubrics and the assessments that Ms. Tammy mentioned in a previous slide. One of the things is that teachers consistently share mark schemes that can help with that. And so we can, we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well with some of the details of what the student can start asking the teacher also in that sense. Now, when we look at 
our students overall and their stress levels and their communication levels. I think one of the things that parents always find the most difficult is that the student starts to pull away and the student does not necessarily uh, want to communicate with you as a parent as to what is happening. And one of the first things that we want to encourage you to do is to not allow them to pull away. You may think that this is the time period where they're learning responsibility, they're learning to be their own um, organizer, but what starts to happen at this point is if we pull away, if we allow them to pull away, we also lose the opportunity to be the support system for them. So what I want to encourage all of you to know is that every teenager is doing this right now during that examination period. They want, they're, they're nervous, they're scared, they'll push you away and that's a natural reaction for them. But as parents, we have to stay with them. And sometimes we have to be there to support them. It's not to nag them, it's not to micromanage them, but it's to basically say that we are here to support you and help you. And so the um, things that we can see here uh, in terms of this slide that we're looking at right now is that what you want to do is you want to start opening the conversation with them. And part of that is just simply asking about the examinations and talking about how they're revising, just asking them questions and not saying, well, this is what you should be doing, but just say, so what are you doing? How are you revising? And if they then open, then you start to open the conversation with them to ensure that you can then start giving ideas if they're struggling to figure out how to revise. And then you also know if they really know how to revise as well. Because sometimes we assume they do, but other times we can't be sure until we ask that question. Um, we also want you to think about the fact that in the home, you need to start establishing and helping support them to establish spaces that are good for their revision location and ensuring that they are eating and drinking at regular intervals. One of the things that students tend to do is they stop showing up for meals because they say they are studying or revising. And what you as parents need to ensure is that they are taking those food and drink breaks that they need because without the food and without the regular hydration, their brains also will stop working. As we know ourselves, if we don't eat during the day, we lose focus and are unable to do that. It's the same for them, but they don't have that adult understanding that they need to catch up on things. And sometimes we as parents have to say, okay, this is dinner time. You're coming out of your room and you're going to eat. No, you can't eat in your room. You have to come out. So you actually take a break and eat properly. So it's, it, we, we have to sometimes take that extra responsibility during that examination time to remind them to care for themselves. And we want to um, also give them time to wind down, make sure that they're actually resting in between, taking that physical activity that we know is extremely important and that we're also structuring a sleep time for them. We, we know that uh, even though teenagers are, it's advised that teenagers get up to 10 hours of sleep a night, most of them do not. And as parents during examinations for preparation time, it's really important that we ensure that they do get those 10 hours, that they're not up until 3 a.m. on the day before the examination. And we, they will say, no, 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 I have to study. But at the same time, if you start putting those boundaries in place for them and helping them to manage that, they will do much better on the exams. And as they begin to revise, they'll realize, oh, I'm remembering more because I slept better last night. And you have to start early with that in the revision time period as well. Um, we want to make sure that you're reinforcing them, that you're not saying, well, you know, you're not... You're just not doing what you need to do and you're not, not as, you're not as focused as you need to do. You need to keep reminding them that whatever they achieve, you are still going to be proud of them 
and that you're there to support them and that you're not angry if they're not focusing, but that you create a system with them to help them understand how they can refocus their efforts, efforts if they're struggling. Um, and we want to be, we want to always keep positive and hopeful through this exam period. Even though it's, uh, even though it can put a lot of stress on you as parents as well, because you see them stressed and worried, it's, uh, as adults, it's our responsibility in some way to keep that atmosphere positive for them and allow them to move forward if they come upon a struggle as well. So we always want to make sure of that. And we want to um, make sure that you have a goal for the end of the exams, perhaps. That after the exams, you as a family decide, okay, the, the, your last exam is this day. How are we going to celebrate that you've completed the exams? Not even knowing the results is important. It's just the fact that they've achieved that process of getting to the end of that examination period. And so what we want to do is um, you want to give them goal, uh, and you can also set interim goals as well during that examination time. Maybe there's one exam that you know is particularly difficult. And after they've completed that exam, give them something to be excited about so that it's an achievable um, activity that's going to be positive for the next set of exams that might come up as well. And you want to remind them that the stress they're feeling is normal that you even feel it as an adult in your workday life in some cases. You're not getting exams, but you're being tested in different ways throughout your life. And remind them that this is just the first experience of what will be coming in the future, but at the same time that if they can start to understand how to manage these types of experiences positively, that everything in life actually will be easier in the future as well. Um, Anxiety is really high right before going to sleep. And one of the reasons why is because it's the last minutes before they have to stop studying. And sometimes that anxiety will increase to a point where they can't fall asleep. So it might be that you need to create a really good routine for them that allows them to separate their thinking from those examinations and allows them to cut off um, electronic devices, whatever it might be that will lessen their anxiety before it's time to fall asleep as well. And you can work with them to uh, develop re relaxation techniques, sometimes just even listening to music, sometimes meditating, sometimes doing, um, just even having a conversation with a parent is sometimes enough just to change the, the routine. And so it's very helpful to start that relaxation before they fall asleep. Um, if it seems like the anxiety and the stress is really very high and your child cannot manage it, you really might need to look at seeking help from your doctor or from an, from an additional psychologist who might be able to help you um, support your child in managing the stress levels as well. Um, sorry, Ms. Gita, we have three comments from the parents in the chat box. Please help me to look at this. Uh, the first one is at 9.14 and it's from Ms. Jessica Timberlake. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, parents should not interfere with our kids learning. Online learning needs more support from teachers to maximum the missing knowledge and skills of each student maybe more one-to-one -one communication with students and with parents. Okay, so um, in terms of this, this is the online learning specifically that you're talking about. Um, and sometimes right now we're also looking at that online learning in terms of how it develops um, for the examinations is, is what I'm understanding. Is that correct? If the, if the questions regarding that. Yes, I think so, but I hasn't received any confirmation from Ms. Jessica yet. I okay. think, Ms. Van, we will take questions at the end. Let, uh, uh, let's continue with the presentation. 
uh, because once we have all the information, I am sure that it will spark some ideas uh, with, with, with all the parents here. So if we can keep those questions until the end, we will have a Q&A session uh, in about 10 minutes time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Mr. Colin, if you could move to the next slide. Okay, so one of the things that we also as parents are not always aware of is what makes, what, what does that exam stress look like? We probably remember taking examinations ourselves, but it's been a while unless we've returned to um, university studies and we're doing more, more tests and things ourselves. But what, what you want to start looking for, for in your child if, they see, if something seems off you really want to look at whether they're, they're feeling confused about things. Have they started not communicating with friends anymore? Have they stopped that communication? Are they feeling moody? Are they really emotional at this time period? And are they having trouble making decisions? And that even small little decisions like what should I eat for breakfast when normally they always know. Those kinds of little signs will give you a sense that they're very stressed as well that they seem to be feeling overwhelmed about everything. And sometimes that overwhelmment can result in just even getting angry at you because you've asked a simple little question of them or ask them to maybe do the dishes and it just seems too much for them at that moment. Um, and we want to make sure that if that overwhelming feeling is there that you know how to start talking to them about it, start, start saying, okay, it's, it's okay to feel overwhelmed Let's manage what you have to do. Let's break these things out and support them in that process. They may also have a lack of motivation to do anything. There are some students who when exams come, they just don't even start revising because it just seems too big of a task for them. So you really have to help, you might really have to help them to organize their time and support them in that process as well. Um, you might see that some has trouble sleeping, falling asleep, Others will just sleep way longer than they probably should. But we also have to remember there's a balance between that. If we, we set regular bedtimes and start helping them do the relaxation techniques that we talked about, we might also see that we can avoid these kinds of things or fix them too. And if they go to bed at a regular time, rather than falling asleep at three or four in the morning, they're going to get out of bed at a normal time as they're preparing for these examinations. Um, you might see that they have tense muscles or are getting headaches. If that's the case, it's probably very stress related um, and you need to find a way for them to do those relaxation techniques. Um, sometimes some students will have a reaction of having an upset, upset stomach or feeling sick. Parents might say, okay, well, that means you don't have to go to school. That means you don't have to do this. But it, the basic problem is not that they're actually sick, it's that they, their stress is causing these symptoms. And so what we have to do is we have to find that balance between that stress level and finding a way to um, get out some of that extra energy or those concerns and really start dealing with that anxiety level. Some students will also start fidgeting a lot. Some may be doing nail biting some teeth grinding. In more recent times, we know that students um, also uh, sometimes will move towards self-harm during these sessions, during this time period as well. And that's something that we want to really look out for. And you want to ensure that you have a way of um, asking your child about these symptoms. And if they become serious um, levels of uh, stress and depression that Really force, that really forces them to change the way they're approaching the things they're doing and that it interrupts everything in their life, you need to seek additional help for that as well. Now, one of the things that we need to consider in terms of this exam stress, what is it that causes it? Why is it that students specifically experience it? And it comes down to a lot of overthinking things in some ways. So if you look at all of these things that are on this list, it's a concern that they might fail. And in, in many cases, it's also 
a concern that they might disappoint you as parents and your family. And so that concern is very big. And this is why it's really important to continually remind them that regardless of their results, that you're still proud of them and that you love them. And that regardless of what happens, you're there to support them because they really want to do well. It's not that they want to fail. It's not that they're, even if you look at them and you think they're being lazy, it's the exam stress that's causing them to not know how to move forward. So it's important to remember that getting upset with them will not relieve that exam stress. We really, as, as parents, we really need to make sure that our children are feeling that support during that time period. Um, and they also, sometimes what the students are really struggling, and this is what, what um, with your questions about the learning processes, they're finding, it understand, they're finding it hard to understand what they need to study. And so what we do require our teachers to have revision lists for the students that they need to review and look at what is it that I need to know for this exam before going in. And if the students have looked at that, have created a system for themselves that they know they have to do step by step for that subject, then they're going to feel much more confident. But one of the problems we have is that students are told about these revision lists, but quite often they don't go in and look because sometimes it's a bit scary to go in and look because then they're going to say, oh my goodness, I don't know everything. And then I have to start again. And, but the problem is that if they don't start somewhere, they end up never starting to be successful in that process. So we, we, as parents, we need to encourage them to look at those revision lists and reach out to teachers if they are not sure of what is required for the exam. And also to ask questions about how those exams are assessed. Teachers always share rubrics and mark schemes as well, but sometimes the students don't understand them. And, and what it needs is that, that, that maybe they sit down with their teacher separately, or even with you to look at that mark scheme and rubric to understand what it means and what they have to do in order to be successful. They're also continually competing with their classmates in some ways. Even though we, we as teachers do not share grades, students tend to share grades and they know what everybody else has gotten in the class. And if their grade is not as good, they often feel like they're inadequate in comparison to their peers. And what we have to remind them is that we do not need to be comparing ourselves to others. We can only compare ourselves to ourselves and that our progress should be based on what we are doing as individuals, not what others are doing around us. We want them to feel pre prepared, but sometimes they just don't. There are some students who will study so hard and know everything and they still don't feel prepared. They may be the most prepared student in the exam and they'll walk into that exam room completely stressed out and worried. And we just have to encourage them that you can only prepare so much. You can only do what is possible. And you as an individual are going to do it to the level that is going to be appropriate for your study needs. Um, what we also find is that students feel like they don't have much time to study. And in courses like the IGCSE and DP, the difficulty that we find is that students have not necessarily been keeping track of all of their work for the two years of the program that they're in. And this is why it's very important that when they start in grade 10, and, I'm sorry, in grade nine, and when they start in grade 11, that they already have a system in place where they store their work that they've been completing and they have revision materials continually developed over the two years. They are right, it's not enough time to just start doing that at the last minute before examinations. So if they do not have those materials in place well in advance, it will be more difficult for them to revise successfully for their exams. In the DP program, we ask our teachers to have completed the curriculum that they are teaching at least by February so that the students have March and April in full to start that revision process in classes 
and also outside of classes so that they can start preparing for those exams. They do have one full week of exam preparation, but that will never be enough to just study for those final examinations. It needs to be a continuous process of storing work, reminding yourself of what you need to know, and ensuring that you know your material from grade 11 all the way through the end of grade 12. For IGSEs from grade nine, all the way to the end of grade 10. And this, this is what makes having two-year programs more difficult because it does require that the students have that system in place well before exams start. Um, students also are always worried that they're just not going to do well on the exams. Even when they complete the exam, they walk out and say, oh, I just don't even know, I don't think I did well. And usually it's all fine. It's just that then that amps them up for the next exam because they're worried, well, I didn't do well on the other one, so how am I going to do well on this one? So we have to have them keep it in the context of every examination. You're going to walk in there, you're going to do your best, and you're going to be as successful as possible. And when you walk out, you are going to not worry about that mark because you need to focus on the next exam again. Um, and what we want to ensure is that when we're talking about the family, that yes, we need to put a little bit of pressure on our students to be successful academically, but we need to ensure that it's not the only thing that we're focusing on, that we remind them that that academic success is a part of the process of learning in terms of examinations, but that also um, there are so many things in life that we are good at besides exams as well. And that exams are not the only thing that are going to impact um, the, your process for moving forward, even in university processes. Because our, our universities are not just looking for students who can do well academically, they're looking for students who are well balanced, who can manage the academic pressure. It might not mean they get the seven on the IB exam, but getting a five is no worse. It's just simply a different level. And it just means that you are a student who tends towards the average grade rather than that 1% high seven that can be extremely stressful to reach. And I, I think one thing we have to remember is it's not bad to be an average student as well. Not everybody can be that top 1% in the world. And if we expect that of every child, we are putting unrealistic expectations on all of our students as well. Um, we can have those expectations and maybe the child has them themselves, but we do need to remember that not every child will achieve that. And so therefore we have to find that balance reminding them that it's okay if you're not that seven. You'll be a five and that's okay you will still get to a very good university. You will still achieve the things that you want to achieve. And you as a person, in terms of achieving the, the goals you want to, will stand out more if you're aware of your limitations and aware of your possibilities beyond just academic high grades as well. So we also want to ensure that um, during that exam stress period that there, uh, when other things are happening in their life that can impact them, that we find a way to also support them through that. I've had students where suddenly um, family emergencies have occurred during examinations and it does impact their studying. And so as families, we need to be aware that sometimes we might have to put something in place in order to support the student during that time period as well with extra things that are occurring that are unexpected too. Now we're going to watch a short video um, that's actually mostly students. It's, it's an older video, but I found it very um, interesting simply because it's from the student perspective and it adds some things that we might as adults have forgotten about when we were taking exams and it puts, it puts you kind of into the position of considering where your child is coming from when they're talking about exams as well. 
We're going to turn on the captions, I think, so it's a little bit easier because um, they're very English accents there. So for some, it might be a little bit harder to understand in some cases. Okay, bear with me as I try and do this, ladies and gentlemen. And Miss Gitta, if you could switch off your mic so we don't get any background noise. Oh, wrong. Mm -hmm. I do remember exams. Apologies, it seems to be the computer moving around without me wanting it. Let me try again. Mm -hmm. I do remember exam stress. I didn't enjoy it very much. I think I get stressed out about coursework as well because you have a deadline. They have the most exams probably that they're ever going to have in their lives in completely different subjects. And it's a time when they have to work incredibly hard. They have to contend with all the body changes that happen to them. It's hardly surprising that they become really quite stressed when it gets to exam time. Yes, we like our child to get the A's, the B's and the C's. But if we start putting too much pressure, that is when a child will start failing because they say, I can't do it. I'm not up to scratch and my parents will feel disappointed in me. I found myself breaking down. You start to worry. You start to think about the future. It will hit you very fast that these things matter. And there's only so much blagging you can do. If they're going out a lot more, perhaps if they're staying in a lot more, if things alter from the pattern which you normally recognise to be your child's behaviour. Some young people do exhibit physical problems of stress as well, particularly around exam time. A lot of children will get headaches or belly aches. I don't feel well. I think it's just the pressure of everything. I tend to put my head in the sand, like, as well, if it's really bad, like, I'll just ignore it. Your child will know what boundaries you usually impose and it just may be worthwhile remembering and um, trying to put yourself in their shoes, remembering how it was for you and just cutting them a bit of slack. Make sure you're calm around your child. It's not easy, but always try so they don't feel your pressure. My mum kind of just uh, gave me a little space to work on my own and see how I develop without saying you should try this, that and the other. She would always make sure I was doing revision and usually she would turn off the TV and all of us would just have to do reading for at least an hour or two. Most schools have learning managers, learning mentors, they have counsellors who can actually help their child through a stressful time. I try and get like my work done as soon as possible, so it's all over and done with, so I've got like lots of time left. But like, on the weekends, like, I go out with my friends, so I have a bit of a break, really. I dealt with it by like, seeing my friends taking the pressure off, just talking about other stuff. And then when it came to the last week, I revised more. And I, I felt better towards the end of it, yeah. If you fail the first time round, you can actually um, analyse everything that you've gone wrong in and basically you can expand on it and actually become better at what you were doing. I failed my last exam and um, I've done a retake and I passed, but I still got one more exam to, to retake and that's in June, but I feel pretty confident about that. But the first time I ever failed my actual exam was really, really hard. So that's why I actually, actually that's the first time in my life where I actually, actually knuckled down and actually did real, real work. If the kid is unwilling to talk to you, let them make the first move, let them have the initiative to say, I need help. And then that's after that one. Because obviously the parents know how to deal with it, they're thinking about like themselves, and they've had a lot more experience with issues. So that's when it clicks in the child's mind and like, yeah, I can do this.
Okay, so I think the, the last statement that that young man made at the end is very important to remember, is that he realized that his parents did know something about examinations and did know how to support him. And once it clicked that he realized that, it was easier for him to reach out and ask for help and support. And so therefore it's really important that we continue to keep the communication open with our children during these exam periods, even when they're pushing us away saying they don't need that support too. So we now have another um, poll here. If you go to the same link on your phones, um, you could write, if you could write down which advice or information that was shared, shared here do you think will help you the most as a parent working with your child during the next, during this upcoming examination period as well? Okay, making them take breaks. Okay, not putting too much pressure on them, yeah. We, I, I think one thing is we tend to worry so much and we want to, them to do well, but we forget that when we continually remind them and pressure them, that we can actually increase their stress as well. It's, it's done with good intentions, but we never know exactly how it's going to impact them if we do it too much as well. Yeah, talking to them continually through the process. I'm wondering how many of you um, find that when you try to do that though, they push you away. Um, and if, if that happens, can you just, in, in the reactions section on Zoom, you have the opportunity to raise a hand and just show us that because I, I think it's important for us to know that it's not just us, not just one person who's experiencing that, but that it's a normal thing for teenagers. Okay, all results are good results, keep trying, yes. Okay, so I, I think that's probably enough time to kind of see what the most important advice has been. But um, I know that there were questions. Are there, um, do we, Mr. Collin, do we want to address those questions right now or for the end? We'll do those in a second, I think, Ms. Gitta. I think we can just find, finish with uh, this point here. Um, the one of the most important things for all of us both teachers parents and students is in the annual calendar we set out when the important assessments are coming up and to ensure that you know for you as as parents that there's no surprise especially when the student is uh, starting to do that final bit of revision but actually that they are working throughout the year on this, then do bear in mind the important assessment dates that we've got coming up. And the focus I wanted to just put on here were our examination dates. So do remember that the semester one and semester two exams taking place towards the end of the semester. 
Also, the window for the IGCSE exams that Miss Anita said that the schedule will, would be shared with parents and students at the start of the spring term. And for the diploma students, that the grade 12s will have their mocks rather than the semester one exams uh, in uh, the end of November, and that their external examinations take place in the first three weeks of May. Unfortunately, and Miss Gitter will be uh, reminding students and parents of this, um, the examinations usually start just at the end of April and they do take place during the long bank holiday, uh, public holiday weekend that we have. The same with the IGCSE exams. They're not, we can't take the days off because there's a holiday here nationally. Uh, we must attend exams all the way through. So just a, a small reminder there. The most important thing to take away today is that owning, supporting and growing regarding assessment is the key to the student empowering themselves in that personal success on their learning journey. It is the student that when they do not understand something should be going to the teacher. It is the student that be saying to parents, I'm not sure about this, what should I do? So that you can advise as well as teachers can advise. Each student has a different learning need. Each student is owning their own journey. So each student needs to be in charge to empower themselves in this journey. 